How are we doing today, students? Great. Um, you didn't say anything. You never say anything. You never answer me. It's because you know I'm not listening. But I am. But I'm not. <laughs> All right, guys. How are we doing? Um, I just asked you that. So uh, let's go through the chapter review. Again, I'm not going to write these problems down, but I'm going to go. Um, hopefully you have IC 11.5 in front of you. Um, so let's go over it. So problem number one, an overstressed engineering student complains that engineering students' GPAs are lower than geography students. He randomly samples some engineering and geography students. He randomly samples 10 of each major. Um, he finds, if he finds that GPAs are lower, he will rise up and start a student protest. Yes. If he doesn't find any evidence, he won't tell anyone. Like, oh, never happened. Um, is there convincing evidence that engineering students' GPAs are lower than geography students' GPAs? Use a two-sample t-test for mu1 minus mu2. So state the hypotheses. Define your parameters. So the hypothesis here, um, anytime for our two-sample t-test, we're going to go mu1, we'll say, equals mu2. And in this case, what's the alternative? He's kind of trying to claim engineering students are lower. Okay, so um, so this is going to be a less than. Why less than? Because if we're about to define our parameters, which is why it's important that um, we define our parameters, because mu1, we want to be less than mu2. So when I define my parameters here, we're going to say where mu1 and mu2 are the true GPAs of engineering students, so um, engine, uh, somebody needs to learn how to spell, engineering students and geography students, respectively. When I put in that word respectively, I'm saying with respect to order. That is, since I said engineering first and I said mu1 first, engineering is mu1 and geography um, is the true mean GPA, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and mu2 is geography students. So let me just explain again what a parameter is. A parameter is a numeric value that describes the population. Well, there's two. Mu1 and mu2, the true average uh, or true mean GPA of engineering students. Mu2, the true um, mean GPA of geography students. So let's remember, why do I use mu here and why do I not use x bar? Well, x bar is a sample mean. I can tell you which sample mean is greater. That doesn't take any inference. That doesn't take any special methods, which number is bigger. When we do statistics, statistical inference, statistical inference is about drawing a conclusion about the population from a sample. So I have 10 randomly sampled GPAs from each major, and I'm trying to make a conclusion. Is the overall, the mean, true mean GPA of engineering students higher than the overall mean GPA of geography students? Because I don't know what either one of them are. I don't know the actual... Uh, mean GPAs of either students, but hopefully from this sample I could infer whether one of them would be greater than the other. Um, in this case, I'd like um, we're trying to show, or we we we're maybe showing that the GPAs of engineering students are lower. Is it true that the overall GPA is lower? Because we don't have every piece of information, we don't have every GPA, so we don't know. All right, so what's a type one error and its consequence? Um, part B. Looking through this, I always look back at the hypotheses and I go, well, this is my null, this is my alternative. So a type 1 error would be, um, let me use a different color here, um, a type 1 error. So when I put 1 here, this is going to be a type 1 error. This would be, you come to the conclusion that the alternative is true when in reality um, the null was true. For a type 2 error, um, it's going to be the opposite. I would have come to the conclusion that the alternative, again, I don't want to use the word is true, but let's just let's just say it. I come to the conclusion um, that the alternative is true or true enough. I come to the conclusion that the null is true or true enough when in reality the alternative was true. 
So a type 1 error, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to write this down because I'm on a time constraint, but a type 1 error, I'm going to go back here, um, is going to be concluding that engineering students are lower GPAs, have lower GPAs, mean GPA. All right, let's uh, erase that. We conclude that the mean GPA of engineering students is lower than the mean GPA of geography students, when in reality, the two GPAs are about the same. The two average GPAs are about the same. So that's a type 1. What's the consequence? The consequence here would be that the student, um, so again, if he finds that the GPAs are lower, he will rise up and start a student protest. Well, um, so you know, he would have come to this conclusion, he would have started a protest when in reality this was true, so he would have unnecessarily started a student protest. Um, what is a type 2 error? This is part C. A type 2 error would be concluding that the two GPAs are about the same when in reality um, engineering students do indeed have lower GPAs. The consequence here is that he won't tell anyone um, but he, he, he should have started a protest, and he didn't. Instead, he's, he's, he's quiet, and he doesn't know this. Okay, so part D. Based on part B and part C, which is worse? Time out. I'm distracted. Why are people distracting me? Okay, sorry about that. Part D. Um, based on part B and part C, what would you set your significance level alpha at, and why? Um, so what do you think is worse, that he starts a protest um, that he shouldn't have or that he missed starting a protest when he wouldn't have? So this is one of these answers that I'm going to leave up to you. Um, what's worse? I don't really think either is necessarily worse. So I would maybe, again, this I'm going to say answers vary. Um, but I might just go, well, both stink, so uh, I'm going to set my significance level at 0.05. That's just something I might do. You, you could have a different opinion. That's fine. Uh, part E, check the random, independent, and normal conditions. So this is going to be two histograms. I'm going to pause the video right here because i got to put these numbers into L1 and L2 in the calculator. Um, maybe you have already done that. If not, maybe you want to pause it as well here too. So random. Um, is the random condition satisfied? Random, yes. Both samples were random. Remember, when we check the conditions, it's not one sample. We need to check that both samples are random. Um, independent, uh, the samples are independent since um, one geography um, GPA will definitely not influence a um, engineering GPA, and also individual samples, individual individual um, samples are independent as well. You know, I think it's easier for me to write in cursive with these stylus. I'm not good at writing with these stylus. Like my handwriting's bad enough. Throw in a stylus, and it's even worse, right? Okay, the normal condition, let's check it. I'm going to flip slides here. So I put in the um, L1 and L2. I put our values into L1 and L2. So I'm going to go to my stat plot, and I'm going to look at stat plot L1. I'm going to zoom 9. And, oh, man, so uh -oh, if you got what I got, it's so funny because I, I actually, just to, you know, you look at that and you go, uh-oh, that's terrible, right? Looks like it's going to violate. So this is, um, this is the engineering students. Now, when I actually randomly sim uh, generate these numbers, um, they're actually supposed to come from a normal population. Um, but this is sometimes just real-life data. Um, I actually told R when R made these numbers up for me, and I told R to randomly sample numbers from a normal population, and it ended up, um, this is what we got. Okay, so um, let's look at the histogram of L2 and zoom 9. And I look at zoom 9, and this looks a little better. It gives me something 
like this. So this was the um, geography majors. I'm going to go back to my stat plot of L1 just real quick, just to kind of make a point. I'm going to um, go to my window button after I choose L1, and it's telling me my x min was 3 and my x max 3.19 and my x max was 4. I'm going to change something. I'm going to put the x min as 3 and the... Um, Sorry, hang on real quick. I'm going to put the x min as uh, 2.5 and the x max of 4, and then I'm going to look at my graph. Eh, gives me a different... Yeah, it still looks a little skewed. Okay. Um, looks a little different, but... Look, so let's check these normal conditions. So um, the geography... For geography... Um, the histogram... shows no outliers nor skewedness um, for engineering the first one um, there does seem to be there does seem to be some skewedness and an outlier. Okay, um, just to make sure, if, if this was on your test, it would be a little more cut and dry, but um, here is our, um, what we get to do. We're going to proceed with caution. That is, you know, maybe our numbers might not be 100% valid and and more so about those borderline cases you know I mean clearly if if we come to one conclusion if the p-value is really small or really big you know I think we'd still be pretty safe in our conclusion it's um, to that point where maybe we have a p-value of 0 0.06 0 0.05 0 0.04 where maybe now this this thing this little um, break of the normal condition will really come and haunt us but you know, for, as I said, for, for what we got right now in our test, um, we're just going to proceed with caution. Okay, calculate all relevant statistics, including degrees freedom. So we're going to go to a two-sample t-test. And I'm going to go to a, my two-sample t-test. And we're going to put in... Um, we're going to put in import input data, L1 and L2. Just make sure when you do the null hypothesis, when you get down to, um, to the last screen, we're going to do mu1 is less than mu2, because that was from our alternative hypothesis right here. Okay. And um, we're not pooling anything unless it tells you to um, use equal variance. So here we go. Let's just pretty much write down everything I got on our screen. Our T score is negative 3.03. Our P value is 0 0.00484. Again, that's gonna um, that's actually good news. Um, degrees freedom 3.09. Um, X bar one. That's the mean engineering GPA 3.089. X bar two. That's the mean. Um, the mean. Where are we at here? Um, the, the mean geography GPA from our samples. Um, its standard deviation was 0.369, um, and its standard deviation was 0.181. Okay. Um, both n values were 10. So. N1 is 10, and N2 is 10. Okay. Um, oh, do you need those numbers again? There. Now pause it. Okay. Okay. Um, make your decision. Okay, so as I said, the decision here, violating that normal condition, it might have been hard to make a strong decision had we had a p-value that was pretty close to our cutoff line, but our p-value was um, 0 0.00484, so... Um, if we and again our alpha was 0.05. I'm pretty. I'm going to go ahead and be pretty confident since this p-value is much smaller 
than our significance level um, to make our decision here. So um, what do I want to see with our decision? I'm going to write cursive again here because it's faster. Since the p-value was less than our significance level, and again, since 0 0.0048 was less than 0 0.05, um, we reject the null. That's not good enough for a decision. The conclusion is there's a question in that problem. Um, and the question is, is there convincing evidence that students' GPAs are lower than geography um, GPAs? And yeah, there is. So there is convincing evidence since we rejected the null. There is convincing, that word says convincing, believe it or not, um, evidence that um, engineering students have lower GPAs GPAs on average than geography students. And when I put in that on average, that was important because if I just said um, that engineering students have lower GPAs than geography students, well, I bet you out there there's a geography student with a GPA of 2.0, and I bet you there's an engineering student with a GPA of 3.8, right? So this is on average, right? We're talking about averages. Phew. Number two. Let's read this problem again. Does taking aspirin affect your risk of having a heart attack? A thousand volunteers at risk for heart attacks were entered a study. 500 were randomly selected to receive an aspirin per day, while the remaining 500 took a placebo. It was a double-blind study. After five years, they found that 32 out of 500 who received aspirin had a heart attack, while 51 out of 500 who took the placebo, um, had a heart attack. Is there a significant difference between the treatment and control group? So again, the treatment group is the one who are going to get the aspirin, and the control group are the ones who are going to get the placebo. Okay, so this is going to be a two-sample z-test for P1 minus P2. Um, so let's write down our hypotheses, part A. Um, P1 equals P2 versus... P1 is what from P2? Well, what question are we trying to ask? Is there a significant difference between the two groups? So you are not equal, right? Not equal. Okay, define the parameters, of course, because I use these words P1 and P2, and how do I know which one's P1 and P2? So where P1 and P2 are the true proportion... Of of uh, of of volunteer of 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 um of who is who is our population here? Um, these are of true proportions of uh, volunteers at high risk for heart attacks. Um, so we'll we'll just write that volunteers at high risk for a heart attack. Um, and let's say who were in the treatment and control group, respectively. So let's look at what I did there when I um, wrote this sentence, because this is probably harder than just the hypothesis, right? Well, okay, so I defined what P1 and P2 were. Um, so P1, so I called it P1 and P2. So they were, the first of all, the true proportion. Again, you know, why do we do statistics? Obviously, we had 51, you know, is greater than 32 or something like that. But that's not good enough. Did this happen by random chance? Is that difference big enough to be significant is, is, is what we're looking for. Um, who's, so it's the per, true proportion of, from my population. My population really, in this case, were volunteers who are already at hit risk for a, a, a heart attack and um, who were in the treatment and control group respectively. That tells me this is number one and this is number two, P1, P2. All right. Um, check the random, normal, and independent condition. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to write, um, I'm not going to write the, ran eh, maybe I should. 
Okay, the random condition here is a little different because I haven't hit this that hard, but I wanted you to recall this. Um, this is a random, these people were volunteers. They're not random at all. They had to have high risk and they were had high risk. Where did the randomness come in? The random came from random assignment. Um, that is, each participant was either randomly so, randomly chosen to receive aspirin or a placebo. That's where the random comes in and it's important. The independent, the independent actually kind of comes here from the fact that it's a double blind study. What does that mean? That means, um, if you recall from when we talked about double blind studies, that means neither the doctor who's giving, neither the doctor nor the patient know whether they're giving a placebo or giving a, a, an aspirin to their subjects. And why is that important? Well, maybe if the doctor knew that this person was receiving a placebo, maybe they wouldn't um, care as much, or maybe they would act differently that might, for some reason, um, have an effect on the experiment. Okay, the normal condition here, normal condition, um, I'll do one of these, two of these, and then I'll show you the shortcut again. We're supposed to check if NP hat, P1 hat, N1 P1 hat is greater than 10, N1, 1 minus P1 hat is greater than 10, and two P and N two P two hat is greater than ten, et cetera, et cetera. Well, only one, et cetera. So um, we had five hundred people, and out of that, thirty two out of five hundred. So there's my P hat. Um, got an aspirin. So these will cancel out, and we're left with thirty two. And these are the ones who got a heart attack on aspirin. This is my number of successes. My number of successes, 32, clearly greater than 10. How about my number of failures? Well, this is going to be 500. Um, I'm doing this part here. N1, 1 minus P1. And um, we're going to have um, 468 people out of the 500 not get a heart attack. Ooh, look what happens to those denominators again. Um, so 468 is greater than 10. So what did this 32, NP, and one p one That was our number of successes. This is our number of failures. So if I do the same thing for N2, the P2 hat, I'm going to have 51 people greater than 10. And how many failures? How many people didn't get a heart attack in that case? 449 greater than 10. Normal condition is met. Okay. Find the test statistics, sample proportions, pooled proportions, z-value, and p-value. That sounds like a job for the calculator, and indeed it is. So we're going to go to our test. I want to remind you, a lot of, I've had students getting confused with the two-sample z-test for p1 and p2. This is a two-prop z-test. Um, this is not a two-sample z-test. The two-sample z-test on your screen is technically a two-sample z-test for mu1 minus mu2. If you ever see a sigma for a z-test, eh, you got the wrong formula. Make sure you got a two-prop z-test. x1 was 32, n1 was 500, x2 is 51, n2 was 500, and we're checking whether p1 does not equal p2. I'm going to calculate, and I got a z-statistic of negative 2.18. Um, I got a p-value of 0 0.029. P1 hat was 0 0.064. That is 64, sorry, 6.4% of people in population 1 got a heart attack after two years. Um, those were the ones who took an aspirin. And P2 hat is 10.2%. Um, that is 10.2% of those not taking aspirin got a heart attack. Um, the calculator just calls this P hat. We call this P bar, the pooled proportion. That's 8.3. Um, That's 8.3% of everybody in this case got a heart attack from both groups combined, the pooled proportion. If you remember the pooled proportion, it's going to be the total number of successes. So that's X1 plus X2. Oops, that was not a very straight line. 
um, divided by n1 plus n2. So the total number of successes divided by the total sample size. Cool? Cool. Not cool. Cool. All right, I'm going to throw this one in here. Um, I kind of ask you part D. We're going to look at this later. What's z squared? That is this um, value of z that I got um, up, up here, um, this one. What's z squared? I'm actually going to uh, show you something cool here. It's about 4.7. I lost a few decimal places, but about 4.76, give or take, after I round it. Hold that thought. All right, part E, make your decision in context. You believe I'm still talking and I'm barely halfway done. All right, um, so E, the decision is since the p-value, again, was smaller than alpha, we were using a 5% significance level, told us in part A. Since the p-value is less than alpha, uh, we reject. A, E, we reject um, the null. There is convincing evidence. that aspirin uh, reduces or, or you could say that they're just not different um, but I'm gonna go ahead and say reduces heart attacks in five years for these volunteers Notice how I stopped short of just going, hey, aspirin, it's the best. It's going to reduce your risk of a heart attack. No, um, because there's lots of limitations to this study, for instance. Number one, after five years. You don't know what happened after 10 years, for instance. Um, number two, it's these were volunteers. They were volunteers at high risk for heart attacks, but how does this maybe correlate to someone who's maybe at a medium or lower risk for a heart attack? You don't know. Um, so there's a lot of limitations, um, but, but we can definitely say for this group, for our observed group, uh, and for if I looked at people um, with, heart, with high risk for heart attacks, assuming these 1,000 volunteers are kind of a decent representation of everyone at high risk, I could kind of go, well, it looks like aspirin seems to reduce the risk of heart attacks within five years. Within 10 years, um, the study's got to go a little farther. Part F, make a 95% um, confidence interval. So part F, we're going to use a 2-prop Z int on the calculator. And in fact, I just went there on the screen, and all the numbers were already stored from what I did before. So I just have to go to calculate. And just kidding, I was at the wrong screen. Uh, <laughs> let me try that again. 2-prop um, z-int, mine's letter B, but yes, all the numbers were stored. I just have to change that C level um, to 0.95 because mine was something else. And I go to calculate, and I got um, negative 0.07 to 1 to point zero, negative 0 0.0039. That is the difference between the proportions who had a heart attack is between 7.21% and 0.39%. That is the true overall difference between the two groups, negative in favor of those people who took the um, aspirin. So that, that's what we're kind of saying, that um, your taking aspirin reduces the risk of heart attack in these two groups anywhere from 7.21% to 0.39%. It's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Good. All right, so number three, we're on number three, and we're like, hey, this is the same problem. Uh-huh, uh we, we, we. And it kind of is, but it's asking here um, for a chi-squared test for homogeneity, right, the hypothesis. What? This is kind of like the same thing we just did, isn't it? Well, let's find out. Um, so part A, a chi-squared test for homogeneity was going to say the null here is going to be the um, the proportion of let me just um, yeah the proportion of those who get a heart attack proportion of I'll just say those volunteers who 
who um, have a heart attack. That kind of covers they either had or not have a heart attack. Um, is equal between um, the, we'll just call them the groups, the experimental groups, the treatment group slash um, control group. Um, and yeah, that's a lot to spit out, isn't it? So we'll just go um, for the alternative. We'll just say that, that they're different, right? That not HO, that the, the proportions are not equal. All right, so part B, check the large sample size condition by calculating the expected counts in each cell. You know what? I'm just going to do this one by hand. Why not? Um, so um, we'll just go H, like had a heart attack, didn't have a heart attack, and we'll call this aspirin in the control group. Um, we had four, 32. So this is the observed values. I'm going to calculate the expected over here. Um, same way, H, not H. A or C. 32, 468, and then here we have 51, 449. Uh, switch up colors here. Um, so we had 500 and 500 in each group. That's 1,000. And here we have, oh man, math is hard, 83, and uh, this should be 1,000 minus 83, which is 917. Yeah. Okay, so to find this expected um, value here, that is how many people, if the proportions are equal, how many people would we expect um, to have a heart attack who take um, aspirin? Well, we're going to do the row total, which is 500, times the column total, divided by the total total. So we're going to do 500 times 83 divided by 1,000. So 83 times 500 divided by 1,000, 41.5. Uh, eh, there's my decimal place. Um, same thing here for, for this cell. Row total, 500 times the column total, 83 divided by um, divided by the total total. Ah, again, 41.5. Surprising. Uh, why did that work? Because both of these row totals were the same, as is the column total. So we're going to find out here that, um, hey, if the proportions are equal, well, we'd expect 8.3% of everybody to get a heart attack in this case. Um, so how many people didn't have a heart attack? So now I'm looking here. Row total, 500. Column total, 917 divided by a thousand. We're going to find this value is also going to be the same for the other one, 458.5. In here we also have 458.5. Excuse me, it's hard to write on this stylus, so I had to go out of bounds there. My preschool teacher would be really upset, but she's been upset the whole time. All right, um, so that's part B. Part C, calculate the test statistics. Okay, I'm going to go ahead now finally and put these values into a matrix. So I'm going into my calculator and I'm going to matrix, um, second inverse, x to the negative one, and then I have to go to edit. And this is going to be matrix A. I'm going to choose, it's a two by two matrix, two rows, two columns. And I'm going to put the numbers in exactly how we see them, 32, 468, 51, 449. Okay, I'm going to quit out of there. And I'm going to go to my test screen and just straight up chi-squared test, not GOF, I'm just doing a chi-squared test. And I'm hitting that, observed A, expected B, calculate, and I'm pretty much done. I got chi-squared was 4.74, and my p-value was 0 0.0294, and my degrees freedom was UNO. Um, do any of these numbers look familiar? Hmm. Hmm. Isn't this the same problem we just did? Didn't we do a two-sample z-test for p1 minus p2? All right, let me see. Let me see. My chi-squared statistic is 4.74. My p-value is 0 0.092. Um, I should definitely come to the same conclusion, right? Um, with this p-value is definitely telling me there is a difference between the two proportions. Well, let's go back and let's look at something. 
Oh, z squared, I said, you know, I did a little rounding here, so 4.76, uh, I rounded that just a little bit. 4.74 chi-squared statistic. Hmm, Velociraptor wonders. P-value here, this was our p-value, 0 0.029. P-value, 0 0.029. Hmm, philosopher, philosopher, raptor, whatever his name is, wonders. Wow, same decision, right? Same p-value, same, almost same test statistic. Um, so I bring this up because actually a um, two by two chi-squared test, which is always going to have one degree freedom, right? Rows minus one times columns minus one, two times one minus two times one, one times one, one, is actually equivalent to a two-sample z-test for p1 minus p2. Huh. It's kind of cool if you think about it. You know, look at that problem a little more, and, and, and I think it'll make sense. All right, last one, number four. We're almost there. And this is a kind of cool problem because sometimes you might get a set of data, and you might wonder, hey, is this set of data approximately normal or not? Well, this is a great way to actually kind of, uh, you could actually do a chi-squared goodness of fit test to see if it kind of, if our results match our empirical, um, our empirical rule. That is, right, 68% of observations should be plus or minus one observation, sorry, plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm actually kind of trying to do in this problem number four is break this up um, into the little eight, quadrants that we learned how to do um, a few chapters ago. So that is, if I know the mean, and if I know the standard deviation, I would expect 34% to be here if that's the mean, 34 b w between here if that's one standard deviation, two, negative one, so these are z-scores, right? Um, I'd expect 13.5% here, 2.35% um, here, and 0.15% uh, here, and same thing on the left side. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so part one, calculate the expected values. Now, here is what I'm going to recommend on these goodness of fit tests. L1, put all the observed values. So I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm going to do this with you. The bell's going to ring on me in a little bit, so I'm going to have to finish this video later. You're going to hear me totally with a different tone of voice a little later. It's going to be funny. You're like, what happened? Um, okay, so right now in L1, I'm putting 4, 14, 33, 43, 55, 47, 19, and 7 into L1. Did I say L3? L1, I put those numbers into. L2, I'm going to put my proportions. So I'm going to put my, my expected proportion. So for L2, I'm going to start out with 0 0.0015, then 0 0.0235 in that whole row that you see there. So here we go. Um, 0 0.0015, 0 0.0235, 0 0.135, 0 0.134, 0 0.34, 0 0.135, 0 0.0235, 0 0.0015. There, I did it. Okay, here's what I'm going to do next now. I need to know my total sample size. So what is my sample size? Um, let's just add all the numbers together. I'm gonna, uh, or you know what, I'm still lazy. I hate doing this. So I'm gonna do this. I'm going to go to my home screen so I quit out of my L1 screen. And I'm gonna go to second stat, which should take me to list. And I'm gonna go one to the right to ops. That's operations. Just kidding? No, no, one more. I'm going to go to math. Number five is sum. Sum, and then I'm going to hit sum, and then um, L1, and then I got 222. Again, you didn't have to do that. You could have just added all the observed counts together, but as I said, I'm a lazy, lazy man. I didn't want to make a second mistake. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my L1, L2 screen, and for L3, I'm going to do the sample size, which was 222, and I'm going to multiply that by L2. Why? This is going to get me the expected value. So again, when I do this, make sure that you, um, you know, when you're in L3 and it gives you like, it kind of does that, make sure you're highlighting L3. So you have to press up first. I actually have to clear my L3, press up, 
and I'm going to do 222 times L2, which was my um, proportions. Okay, so I got, um, so my expected counts, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to write the whole chart down. Um, I got, I'm going to change pen because I don't like this color, um, 0.33, 3, um, 0.5.2, I'm going to round them, um, 30.0, 29.97, rounds to 30. Point zero. Uh, then I got 75.5, and I'm going to find by symmetry uh, these numbers are going to repeat themselves again. 75.5, um, then I should be back down to 30, then 5.2, hey, um, hey, sorry, <laughs> 5.2, and then lastly, 0 0.33. So that's going to be the expected. Okay, so we're going to do a side-by-side -side bar chart now of the expected values versus the um, observed proportions. And I'm going to leave this one. I don't have the time to do this right now, but you will have to do this for your test. Look at that, the bell's ringing. Um, so I'm going to leave that one up to you. Part C. Uh, I'm going to see if I could actually kind of finish this quickly before all the students from fifth period come running in. Part C, um, state the hypotheses. So the hypothesis, the distribution of, um, what is this, um, test scores? No, heights. The distribution of heights um, is as claimed. And what's the claim here? That it follows a normal distribution, follows um, an approximately normal distribution, that is. That's the claim versus that it doesn't follow a normal distribution. All right, part D has to check the conditions. Which one has been violating? violated? What could we have done to not violate this condition? So, yeah, um, the conditions were random. Um, okay, so again, I'm not going to write all this down, but yeah, uh, it says that it was a simple random sample. Um, independent, we would assume that one person's independent, one person's height doesn't influence another. Um, no, you're fine. You guys could say it. I got students coming in. Max is here. Max is going to hear this video later, and he's going to be like, "Say hi, Max." Hi. That was an awkward hi. voice. How you doing, Diego? All right, all right. This is awkward. Um, check the conditions. Which one has been violated? Uh, that was the expected counts. Um, we'll assume independence. The expected oh, counts. Yeah, 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 I'm doing the video on it right now. Sorry. The <laughs> expected counts aren't greater than five. I'm going to pause this and finish it later. It's going to be awkward. All right, so whatever just happened, that was awkward. Um, I had to get back to recording here. Um, we're on part D, which condition had been violated, and the expected count condition, because the expected counts um, for z-scores less than three and um, greater and greater than three were 0.333 and 0.333 respectively. That's not big enough. Um, what could you have done? Well, we could have just combined these categories. That is, we could have said, well, we could have had any z-score less than negative two, and then add the two proportions together. So. Um, 0 0.0015 plus 0 0.0235 to get 0 0.025. And also on the right side, we could have said anything greater uh, than 2 uh, would work here as well. And same thing, um, add the, combine the two categories. And in this case, that would include combining the proportions, adding the proportions, that is. Okay, so calculate the test statistic. What degrees freedom? This is the point where um, you should have in your calculator... Um, we'll go to the chi-squared goodness of fit test, and <clears throat> the observed was L1. My expected, again, was L3, because if you recall for the expected values, L3 was our um, L2 times the sample size, which I think in this case was 22 times 22, um, 222, that is. So the um, observed is L1, the expected is L3. How many degrees freedom? It's K minus 1, where K equals the number of categories. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 categories. So the degrees freedom should equal 8 minus 1, or 7. Uh, all right, so I'm going to put that in. <clears throat> Calculate. 
and I got a pretty big chi-squared statistic here. Um, of Sorry, I'm looking at my numbers. They seem abnormally big, so I'm just going to pause this for a second. Sorry, I, <coughs> I said abnormally big because I was actually surprised to... I was surprised to get a, a, a test statistic this big and a p-value this small. And uh, so I got a chi-score of 254.57. Did you get that too? Wow, it's big. It's big. Um, so the p-value was, oh wow, really, really small. 2.94 times 10 to the negative 51st power. And uh, then it does go down below with these contributions. So um, while these contributions are up on the screen, let's actually skip to part G, which asks which categories deviate most from what's expected. And what we can do now is look at that contribution, C-N-T-R-B, and let's kind of scroll through those numbers and see which one is the biggest. I got 40-something, 14.3, that's not too big, 13, 5, Nine, thirty-six, one hundred and thirty-three. So my last number here in the contribution was one hundred and thirty-three, which is way big. Um, 0.48. So that's going to tell me that the z-scores over thirty—that is the last category over thirty—that is deviates most from what we'd expect. Sounds like there's a lot of outliers. Um, if I'm thinking in terms of a normal distribution, having seven values um, outside of three standard deviations is really telling me that, boy, there's a lot of outliers in this particular distribution. So last part, part F, let's wrap this up. What's your conclusion? The p-value was small, so we reject the null. Um, we reject the null, meaning that there is evidence that the distribution is different um, than as claimed. That is, there is convincing evidence that this does not follow a normal distribution. Uh, last thing I'll say, because the bell rang, i got to start the next class, and um, I will upload this as soon as I can. Um, last thing I want to say is that you can actually do this, um, what we just did in problem four, to really see if you, ha if you have a set of data. Um, there's tests that are essentially goodness of fit tests that tell you how well um, certain data is to being normal. So, cool. Hope that was insightful, helpful, and all of that. And uh, good luck. Happy studying.